I am a psychometrician on the faculty of our own graduate school of education. Um, and I think those of you who know what psychometrics is might be puzzled by what a psychometrician is doing in a session entitled The Art of Teaching. Um, I, I also think that as you look at the two words that are my topics today, uh, evidence and assessment, and juxtapose this with what Jennifer was just speaking of, that is time and skill, and what Jonathan is about to speak about, which is passion and sincerity, I think at best my words seem like they don't belong. <laughs> I, I think at worst one might be legitimately concerned that a focus on evidence and assessment might in fact end up distorting and corrupting the art of teaching itself. So this is an old concern. Um, we might frame it as a contrast between process and outcome. Uh, and be concerned again that if we focus our teaching and learning too much on outcomes, this might distort, disrupt, confuse the learning and teaching process itself. Um, and that's actually not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'd like to reframe this um, contrast, this potential zero-sum game, uh, with a, a different kind of framework. Um, and I'm gonna present it in terms of a metaphor. Uh, this is a metaphor for the perils of numbers and quantification more generally. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about this metaphor uh, in the first part of my talk, and then I'm going to flip it around um, and try to convince you um, that there's actually also great promise, the flip side promise of this peril, that we might not only have an opportunity to address, but we might actually in fact have a responsibility to address. And then I'll close with the implications um, uh, of, of this metaphor and of my point for the Harvard community as a whole. So um, the metaphor uh, is, is simple and it begins with the idea that numbers tend to travel. Um, I'm gonna start with an example of a number that might travel and that's a grade that I might assign to a student in my statistics class. And let's say that that happens to be an A minus that you can see in the lower left hand corner here um, because an A minus as rumor would have it is the average grade that's given here at Harvard University. <laughs> as we would have it. Um, and so again, the idea is that this number can go on a journey, right? I can take this number and average it with all the other numbers in my class and come up with a classroom average, the classroom average grade for my statistics class, which let's say is an A minus. These are, these are, these are toy data, right? <laughs> Um, and we can average these classroom grades and watch it go on another step along its journey to a potentially school average. Again, it's toy data, but this could be the Harvard Graduate School uh, of Education's average grade. And we can average this still further to the average grade that I just joked about, the average grade at Harvard University. And so again, the idea here is that numbers go on a journey, and that journey is often described by this process of aggregation, of averaging, right? We take numbers and they tend to scale up. But that's not the only way that numbers can travel. Numbers can also be adjusted, and I'm gonna make this A minus and A plus, and how can I have possibly done that? I can base that on the expectations that I had for that student, given the data that I knew about her coming in. I could take her SAT and GRE scores, for example, I could take her prior class scores and estimate what grade she might have had. And an A minus might in fact be a lot higher than I might have expected from her prior data. And so I can actually say, you know, compared to expectations, you're actually getting an A+. And then what I can do is average that further to the classroom level and say, you know what, a lot of students in my class are doing a lot better than we might expect given their prior data. And I might call that the value that I add to my students. I could call that the teacher's value added. Right? Again, we see these numbers, they're adjusting and they're averaging. And of course, we can do still more. We can take that number and predict whether or not my student is going to do well in her future career or job, and I can also predict what her salary might be. So the idea here is that numbers tend to travel, they tend to go on this journey, but that's actually not the metaphor that I wanna leave you with. The metaphor is one that is more epidemiological. The idea is that this journey is not random. We can predict it. We can talk about its spread of these numbers along known vectors. We can take away the numbers themselves and think about the forces that carry these numbers in these predictable directions. And I mean epidemiology here quite intentionally, right? And a little bit cautiously. Um, it's almost like the spread of an epidemic 
or a disease, right? We can think about how these numbers spread, predict them, and think about the vectors along which they travel. Right? So um, for those of you who are um, in the faculty of arts and sciences, you might know about how numbers travel. And this is just one of many examples. Um, so for those of you who know the Q guide, um, you, your students' evaluations are collected, and you, uh, the students are, are given the op option to, to, to assess you on a one to five scale. And this is just an example of a little bit of a story of how this averaging happens. And we can see here that this is the instructor's mean score. And we can actually sort classes in the faculty of arts and sciences by average Q scores. This is just an example of how numbers travel, again from the lower left-hand corner, up through these averaging processes. Now what is useful about the epidemiological perspective? The epidemiological perspective makes this completely unsurprising. We should have seen it coming. And in fact, we might be able to predict what's going to happen next. Right? We know what the vectors are, and we can predict and anticipate where these numbers will go. It's also important to note that each step along this journey creates new meaning for these numbers. They have different consequences. The arguments that I might have made about the basis for my grade here are different from the claims that I'll make about their averages and different from claims about the averages at still higher levels of aggregation. Every step that number takes adds new meaning not, and new consequences, not just for the student, but for the instructor, the instructor's school, the instructor's university. Right? We should have known that these numbers would have been averaged. We should have known that TFs would start to get credit for and, and acclamations for uh, getting a 4.5 or higher. We should have known that these averages are going to be used um, for teacher evaluations and reviews for promotion and tenure. This should have all been anticipated. So what are the vectors um, that lead this to happen? Again, what's useful about the epidemiological perspective is that we can predict, but we can also think about the etiology. We can think about the causes of the journeys of these numbers. Right? And I'll mention two in particular. The first is that we are weak to numbers. Right? We see them and we gush. Right? And this is where we, we just say, oh, that, that's really convincing. Um, the, uh, um, our own Larry Tribe in the uh, law school here um, once called in the context of, of legal arguments, he called numbers overbearingly impressive, which I think is a, a, good, a good term. Um, for those of you who know Theodore Porter's work, he's a sociologist. Um, he wrote a book called Trust in Numbers that are exam examines our, our, uncritical, uh, our uncritical ability to just, to just be convinced. Um, and of course, our own Stephen Jay Gould um, talked about in his book, The Mismeasure of Man, our, our tendency to slip from thinking that a reliable measure is automatically a valid measure, particularly in the context of human intelligence. So these, this is one vector that assures that numbers will travel at great distances in time and space from where they might originate. Um, a second vector that we might think of that I do a lot of work on in the School of Education um, has to do with accountability. Um, and accountability is not a vector. It's just something that we observe happening. What is the vector that allows numbers to aggregate and be used for accountability purposes? And I would argue that accountability derives first and foremost, from a lack of trust. We hold people accountable because we don't trust them to be responsible. So the trust, the void in trust that happens at the aggregate level is filled by our trust in numbers. And this is yet another vector along which we can predict the journey of numbers. So all of this is pretty scary. Right? Why would we want to engage in this process of quantification if we know where things are going to go? If we know that our numbers are going to be co-opted and used and over-interpreted, right, it's kind of like what we're doing here in these controlled environments, and here's my little picture. Of, of, it's like we're raising an animal in captivity, and we don't want to release it into the wild. Right? We know these vectors are waiting there like predators to like, sweep up our numbers, to take our carefully crafted assessments, and once we release them out into the world, the people are going to use these numbers and distort them and use them for nefarious purposes. Um, and so that turns to the second part of my argument today, which is the flip side promise of this scary process that I described, and that in, is encouraging all of us here today to engage with quantification perhaps more than we might otherwise. It is an opportunity that we might have a responsibility to address. So this is both good offense and good defense. 
right? So um, um, as Alan mentioned in his opening remarks today, we are definitely at an interesting time in higher education where, as Bill Bowen puts it in his, um, in his recent uh, work, he calls it the cost disease in higher education. And as Alan mentioned this morning, the past two State of the Union addresses included calls for us to, de to consider rises in tuition and to assess the value that we are actually providing to our students. So this is a time when we might want to play defense, but I'd rather spin it in terms of a good offense. Um, I'm actually quite curious about why I can't produce this graph. This graph on the vertical axis shows my teaching however I choose to define it. And on the horizontal axis shows last year to this year. And I would love to have that arrow have a positive slope. But I can't, I have, I have very little evidentiary basis on which to make this argument. And I challenge all the teachers here today to try to draw this graph and try to defend it. Right? I think we should be curious, genuinely curious, about this and our trajectory as teachers over time. And I think we have a responsibility to engage with it, both quantitatively and qualitatively here, um, uh, more than we do. Now, again, let me be clear that I'm, we can use all sorts of evidentiary basis to define that vertical axis, quantitative or qualitative. But I do want to push on quantification because of that metaphor that I showed. There is great peril in quantification, but there is also great promise. People are weak to numbers. Perhaps, dare I say, we should take advantage of that. So the idea is to be responsible about our quantification and move from a game of prediction and passive, oh no, my numbers are leaving me, to control of them as they move on these predictable pathways. The idea is that I can create an assessment, ideally, that is inoculated in some way, that I can control the vectors, I know where it's going, and I'll be able to control that path at every step. Um, so the idea here is we can choose what to put in that lower left-hand corner, and we can manage these vectors because they know we know how they work. Um, and of course, this requires um, more uh, time uh, and incentives and resources than we have, um, and that's where I'd like to lead. Um, this, let's be realistic here. Uh, as instructors, we are quite pressed for time, uh, and as, uh, as in the incentive systems that we have as faculty in this university, they don't work to our advantage. We also simply don't have the resources to be able to design these assessments on our own. So I'd like to close. My first part was to talk about how numbers tend to travel and their peril. My second part was to talk about their potential. And my third part was to talk about what we might do as a university to organize around this. And I'd like to make a set of strategic calls to action um, to various um, locations in this university. Um, and I'll start with um, the, the Bach Center. The Bach Center, as you know, serves the, the, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and has assessment resources. And I would call for those assessment resources to be enhanced, for this to be a center that all of us can call on um, in order to um, have embedded experts in assessment to help us with our developing assessments in our classes. I would also call on our offices of institutional research, and I would also call on our registrars to be able to give us de-identified and aggregated information about the students who are coming into my class. I would like to know if, they, if the rises in scores and my general impression is changing because my teaching is getting better or my students are getting better. And we know so little about our students coming in. We always have to pull them ourselves. Um, I think there should be something in institutional research and our registrars where we know the, the students and their backgrounds coming in. Um, I would also call on us as assessment experts um, to make ourselves available to the community at large. I might imagine having a seminar in let's say a year or so with graduate students trained in psychometrics like Alejandro um, and who are actually embedded with you as teachers. You come to us and say, these are my goals. This is, this is what I'd like to measure. And we'll help you do that with an eye towards reliability and this crazy process that I showed you. We know those, ve those numbers will average and be adjusted. How can we anticipate that and inoculate these numbers so that they won't be used against us? Um, and I would call on our School of Education, where we have a number of researchers and faculty members and students who are doing great work on effective teaching. We should be able to communicate this to the rest of the university. Um, and finally, I'd like to call on all of us. Um, I know that there is great uh, concern about numbers and quantification, but I don't want this to be a passive process. We don't want to stand helplessly by as those vectors control us when we know exactly what they're doing and, and we can think about how we might manage them. Um, I would call on uh, all of us to not just be satisfied 
by applause at the end of our lectures or high Q scores um, at the end of our semesters. I think all of us should be curious about describing the change in our teaching from year to year, and I think that quantification is one tool that we might engage um, to, to use that. Um, so with that, I'll close, and we look forward, I look forward to your questions. Thanks.